Reality TV is one of the single most hated forms of popular media. Christian rock and those things underneath Snapchat stories could maybe give it a run for its money in terms of cretinism and undisguised exploitation, but it's still clear now, years after the genre's peak, that it occupies a space reserved for the lowest of the low. Sloppy, processed, deceptive gruel featuring narcissists whose mental breakdowns and freakish habits have been filmed by hapless interns and ground into a fine paste for the consumption of the lowest common denominator. Non-stop music cues, screaming, fighting, cheating, captured and slickly edited episodes brimming with barrages of light and sound intent on leaving the viewer no time to consider or process, only consume. It latches onto the basest human thought processes, drawing us like moths to the constant visual and emotional stimulus that can only be provided by shaky cam glimpses of 20-somethings screaming at one another over evocations of Blink-182. It's not pretty. At the genre's inception, producers welcomed it with open arms due to the low production costs and almost universal appeal. And while the genre's popularity has waned along the path of TV's gradual decline at the hands of the internet, it remains a network staple. From the start, the intention was that the funds freed up by these low-cost, low-brow shows would allow networks to invest in more genuine scripted artistic efforts. If such a quality increase in standard programming ever arose, it was invisible. Jersey Shore was one of reality TV TV's crown jewels. It was sickening, offensive, intimate, and unbelievably popular. Before the series even debuted, calls had already arose for its cancellation, and over the series' six-season, three-year run, it mutated both into a cultural object representing unashamed depravity and a precise answer for how low network television was willing to stoop for ratings. However, despite Jersey Shore's viewership of 9 million and its newfound spot in the popular consciousness, there wasn't a common understanding, culturally, of what the show exactly was. Of course, there's the obvious Dionysian components. Constant casual sex with strangers, cast members with IQs comparable to measurements of room temperature on a chilly day, and liver-crunching, apocalyptic drinking. But you can't make a show that's exclusively those things. This thought, anyway, is what prompted me to watch the whole show. A mistake I'll live to regret. It's not necessarily that it's bad. Ignoring that a descriptor that general and devoid of nuance can't really capture anything, regardless of how true it may be, the emotions that bubbled up during my gradual and psychically taxing watch weren't those of just seeing a bad show. And to be frank, I think those dismissing the show in that way and lamenting its role in the death of morality and high art are missing something essential. They don't know what they're looking at. So don't look at me like a f***ing weirdo. I'm heartbroken. So let me dance. Mm, 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 mm. There are two questions that need to be addressed at the head of this video. This is the first. Is Jersey Shore racist? I'm not talking about the actual content of the show so much as its conception and marketing. The idea behind Jersey Shore is deeply tied to the term Guido, a piece of slang meant to describe young Italian Americans who tan, work out, and party voraciously. Several sponsors, including Domino's, pulled ads from MTV over the advertising of Jersey Shore before its release, after backlash from groups representing Italian Americans, who saw promo for the show and understandably went ballistic once they understood what it was. Here's a gem excerpted from a letter written by a representative of the National Italian American Foundation to the CEO of Viacom. A show, such as this one, is a giant leap backwards for our society and damages the image and sensibilities of Italian Americans. Dower stuff. Despite the gravity of the accusations levied against the show, when Sally Ann Salsano, the auteur behind Jersey Shore, and various cast members have been needled about its potential damage to the image of Italian Americans, they all generally provide a loose denial of any connection between the show and Italian Americans, which seems kind of ridiculous when you consider the giant Italian flag and Scarface poster prominently displayed on the set for the entire show. This is a good point at which to note that at least a quarter of the show's cast isn't Italian at all. Snooki, despite being the giant histrionic bobblehead representing Jersey Shore in pop culture, is Chilean. This is never brought up on the show. So to answer the question of whether or not Jersey Shore is racist, I have absolutely no idea. This is the second question. Is Jersey Shore fake? In order to address this, we need to be on the same ground about what constitutes a fake reality TV show. Every reality TV program has some dimension in which it's fake, but they vary tremendously in terms of magnitude. On the fake end of the spectrum, we have the Real Housewives franchise, in which characters meet at the producer's request, retake shots and alter dialogue to increase clarity and form more cohesive storylines, and in some instances are even fed lines verbatim. There's no shortage of articles claiming dramatic deception on the part of various studios responsible for reality TV, but it's often difficult to get clear answers about what specifically is fake in programs like this, since everybody involved is under nuclear grade NDA. While there's not really any upper bound on how fake reality TV can be, there is a lower bound. It's easy to forget that in order for a show to be watchable, there's a tremendous amount of preparation and intrusive equipment that must be employed. Cast members have to be mic'd, and there's always a stoic cameraman present, often uncomfortably close. The constant presence of a stranger with a large camera pointed at you necessarily alters the way you interact, a fact that's easy to forget after you've been watching doe-eyed for 40 minutes. But in a show like Jersey Shore, 
where cast members are filmed 24 hours a day, both by handheld cameras and a matrix of static cameras throughout the house, numbering firmly in the double digits, it quickly becomes a fact of life. If interviews with the cast are to be believed, after a few days in the shore house, you forget you're being watched. There's also the inevitability of the show's editing. Shoots for seasons of Jersey Shore last for over a month and have to be condensed into 9 to 13 40 minute episodes, which means that less than 1% of what happens can actually be conveyed to an audience. So a tremendous amount of what happens is never shown, and by nature of Jersey Shore being a network TV show, what we are shown is what's most likely to keep people watching. On top of these practical realities, there's also the power of the edit itself. As has been shown many times, editing is a tremendously transformative process. We can use these techniques to tell almost any story we want. We can make it look as though Ashleen's bored of me, or we can take two shots that happen sometime apart and combine them to make me look like a lecherous scumbag. And with the sheer volume of footage, audio, and on-the-fly interviews producers have to work with, nearly any storyline can be concocted regardless of how true it is to the experience of the cast members. This is not just wanton manipulation. It's utterly necessary for the show to be anything close to watchable. Without the emphasis and digestion inlaid by the the show's editors, there's really nothing notable about eight strangers living in a house together and sleeping past noon every day. It's only by the unholy genius of editors that the show is compelling in the slightest. I firmly believe this is a type of fakeness viewers should be thankful for. While it's normally near impossible to track down reliable information about what degree of manipulation is present in a reality TV show, when it comes to Jersey Shore, interviews with the cast and testimony from producers of the show actually offer a fairly comprehensive picture. Producers place severe limitations on what cast members were allowed to do while living in the Shore house, including ban any form of entertainment, note writing, or unsupervised contact with the outside world, and requiring a one hour heads up before any cast member could leave the house. The atmosphere, according to the cast, was downright carceral. Yeah, you know. The yeah. camera's never down. Even when we're sleeping, it's no. still above our ceiling. Like, it's above our head, everything. There's never a time we're off camera except we're in the bathroom. The only escape from constant filming was the bathroom, leading to cast members taking extraordinarily long showers. But even the bathroom was fair game so long as more than one person was involved. According to the cast, the lack of stimulation and constant stress resulting from the these five-week shoots accounted for much of the excessive drinking. In the first few seasons, producers only rarely instigated events, such as the question-answering game in the fourth episode of season two, presumably because the circumstances produced enough conflict that further intervention wasn't necessary. The presence of producers also helps explain phenomena like the sheer number of women in Seaside Heights willing to have spontaneous on-camera sex with Jersey Shore cast members. The situation and Polly D are not astrally gifted pickup masters, but rather the women who approach them have been scouted ahead of time, chosen presumably for their lack of decision-making brain power and all but told to show up DTF, as the cast would put it. This filming situation might seem sadistic or extreme, but compared to other reality shows, it's not just very mild but downright truthful. Cast members were not fed lines or told how to feel, at least for the first few seasons. And as a decent watch of the show could tell you, such direct manipulation may not have even been possible. In the moments where the cast have clearly been instructed to do things or present ideas as if natural, they take on a lazy, blank-faced reluctance that's clockable from a mile away. Not only are these people not actors, they're not particularly smart either, and I don't intend to be cruel or dismissive by saying that. The cast of Jersey Shore was selected for their lack of inhibition and inability to operate in their own self-interest. Were these people smart enough to act along with producers believably, or not scream about their relationship drama and piss in public for the entertainment of millions of gawking onlookers, they wouldn't have been cast for Jersey Shore. Producers wanted the most emotionally unstable, venomous, self-destructive individuals they could possibly get their hands on, and they succeeded in 10-point fashion. The violent breakdowns, alcoholic fervors, and flippant infidelities of the show are, generally speaking, real. This is a fact that's as alarming as it is interesting. The fabric of Jersey Shore is taught with a series of ill-advised and or hedonistic but all-around terrible events involving the show's cast, with producers complicit in the result. The fourth episode of Jersey Shore, which shot the show into relevancy after a quiet debut, is notable only because Snooki gets punched in the face by a 24-year-old gym teacher at a bar while a cameraman films the whole thing. She wails on the floor, people shout at each other, and the gym teacher gets arrested. What I'm chipping away at here is that it's actually way more concerning that the show is mostly real than it would be if it was the scripted consumer product people commonly say it is. Despite being presented in a somewhat deceptive and unholistic way, what you're seeing is the plain thought processes of incredibly scary people. Which isn't to say the cast doesn't exaggerate or alter their behavior for the camera. They do. But these deceptions are almost all obvious and highly revealing. What becomes clear after watching seasons of Mike the Situation, frantically asserting his status as a successful partying playboy despite his constant rejections and petty fits, is that he's insecure about his life and reputation and desperately craves the validation of his roommates and the viewers at home. He smashes phones and throws out guests when girls reject him, and he spends two entire seasons trying to convince Snooki, who is clearly not interested in him at all, to leave her boyfriend for him. This latter failure spurring enough cognitive dissonance to send the situation into a weeks-long school shooter arc, during which he avoids his roommates and constantly complains about how they don't appreciate him. 
It never seems to occur to the situation that everybody can see through his near sociopathic veneer. Everyone on the show is deeply insecure and their inability to conceal it is a fundamental source of the show's appeal. The most memorable moments largely aren't those of excessive drinking or partying, but when Ron and Sam's horrifically abusive relationship culminates in episodes upon episodes of physical violence, property destruction, and screaming, or when the stress of eight weeks of non-stop filming and being constantly stalked by crowds numbering in the thousands for seasons four and five turns Venny into an anxious wreck, and his roommates can't conceive of any solution to his despair but more drinking and partying, the only thing he's been doing for five seasons. Jersey Shore knows this is why you're watching, and as such what the producers want is violence and crying, not happy-go-lucky partying. The more on-screen despair, the better for them, and the more macabre and entrancing the show becomes. What you're being subjected to is really a sequence of unflattering, awkward, ugly failures, a series of somber reminders that it's hard to be or do anything in life. Though these are people selected for their ability to reveal themselves on-screen in this way, it's all too easy to get lost in this perception. The truth is, subjected to these conditions, just about anyone would be rendered emotionally naked too. I doubt it's it's possible to understate the mental toll constant observation has on a person. The gapless filming schedule and lack of free access to the outside world beckons comparisons to a panopticon, and that's just the beginning of the filming conditions. By the third season of the show, it wasn't even possible to reliably film outside anymore because legions of fans would stock production wherever they went. They'd camp outside the house and shout at the cast, forming further isolation via over-observance. Then there's the expectations of the producers, the desire to seem cool and likable for the audience, and for many cast members to maintain a facade. These conditions are livable for brief periods but undoubtedly begin to eat away at the cast. The goal of the show, from the outset, was essentially to torture this group of highly neurotic people until they destroyed one another and broke down on camera, all for the entertainment of us at home. The morality of all this, regardless of the double-take-worthy compensation for those affected, is pretty obvious and it's probably not necessary to poke at it too much. Nearly every aspect of the show, from the advertising down, is based on exoticizing these people. They color grade certain scenes in a way that makes cast members appear sickly orange, make special emphasis of any lingo the cast uses, like GT TL, DTF, grenade, smush, etc., and generally focus on the excess of the cast's behavior, devoid of certain context that makes it more understandable. If you come to the conclusion that the show intends to attach itself to Italian-American culture, it's concerning at minimum. It's unlikely that anyone's expecting a reality TV show to treat its cast with respect, but the exploitation of these people is on another level. Nevertheless, they all go along with it. For that amount of money, I would too. What's the favorite Jersey Shore moment of all time? Me getting punched in the face. I'd like to emphasize at this junction that I don't hate Jersey Shore, I'm fond of it. What I feel towards the show is in part what it's designed to create in viewers, revulsion mixed with intimacy. As I've already said, the reasons and morality behind the decision to make the show like this are both obvious and not really within the scope of this video. The effects it has are a different story. The typical episode of Jersey Shore goes like this. Everyone wakes up well past noon. Snooki and or Dina comment about how they wish they were still drunk, and in some instances do immediately go out drinking. The male half of the cast leaves to GTL, and the female half either get lunch or stay inside. Somebody ruins a basic meal in the kitchen at some point. An aimless gripe or petty drama is brought up, and people whine and do their best to avoid resolving the conflict. That night, the cast leaves to party at Karma or an analogous nightclub. All cast members drink heavily. Vinny, The Situation, Polly D, or some combination of the three manage to convince someone to come back home with them. A conflict occurs among the cast that may or may not involve the women procured from the nightclub. A member of the female cast and or Ronnie has some flavor of petulant conflict with their significant other over something meaningless or misunderstood. The cast goes back to sleep in the moments before the sun peaks over the horizon. Rinse and repeat, basically. After a certain point in the show's nearly 50-hour runtime, the cast's daily activities cease to be notable or transgressive. The moments that stay somewhat memorable are those that diverge from this basic formula and accidentally reveal something subtle about how a cast member thinks, such as when Wow gets upset that her room don't know how to say grace, or when someone clogs the toilet with a t-shirt and nobody's willing to admit it was them. The actions that betray the intended image of infinitely cool party monsters who bask in supernatural glory, and reveal those same figures to be, like all of us, very uncool people. It's a necessity of the show's format that significant portions of runtime must be dedicated to these vaguely sad intricacies of daily life, an addition that constantly contradicts the lifestyle the show purports its cast to have, with the small oddities and embarrassments that are both universal and unique to each person. Most of the cast very obviously lack basic social skills involving self-awareness and respect, and the uncomfortable moments that regularly result from this only further these contradictions. This level of truthfulness is, in my eyes, too irrational and nebulous to be faked in a show this low-budget, low 
highbrow. The partying Guido is a fictional and contrived persona, unable to remain convincing under these circumstances. And so the marketable presentation of the show becomes unconvincing, and what remains is the bits of real existence the show manages to capture. The truth is that it really doesn't matter how much of the show is fake, because the fake moments aren't what's notable about the show anyway. No amount of producer interference can replicate the depth of an actual person with no filter, who always manages to peek through at some points, regardless of how many fake parties and fake jobs they're sent to, or how carefully they're edited. The intricacies are beyond the ability of any network television screen writer. None of Jersey Shore's impersonators were able to capture a comparable level of success for this reason, I think. They relied too heavily on types of drama that do not occur naturally and did their best to erase the human aspects of their cast members in the name of a leaner, less complicated program. Geordie Shore, the British adaptation of Jersey Shore, does the best of these derivative shows at capturing the essential elements of the original by forcing its cast to do very little besides drink and spend time around one another, which results in a similarly chaotic and unpleasant dynamic, though with the added unintelligible Britspeak and unhinged degeneracy that only the English are capable of. Compared to the nearly military productions of other reality shows, the first season of Jersey Shore was a ramshackle affair, with the cast not even getting paid besides what they made at their on-screen job, and only a single day's notice being given before filming began. The lack of resources on hand may have ultimately been to the show's benefit, since until the later seasons the producers didn't seem to have the capacity to consistently meddle with the events on screen, making these earlier seasons appear less coerced than, say, season 6, where it's abundantly clear that the cast has no desire to be there whatsoever, and producers shuffle them along like corpses to parties where they do little besides drink and provide us with quiet, petty bickering, residual from previous seasons. The most iconic sample of seemingly real drama on the show is the relationship between Sammy and Ronnie, which starts in season 1 and becomes the show's highly unpleasant core. Initially, Sammy is the subject of the situation's affections, but by the second episode she's become involved with Ronnie at least partially out of spite for the situation, a dynamic about which Ronnie seems somehow both ignorant and paranoid, resulting in perhaps the most literary moment of Jersey Shore, in which Ronnie's overbearing jealousy leaks through as he asks for clarification after being with Sammy for less than a day that she didn't hook up with the situation in a way intended as casual but which comes across as transparent and creepy. You hooked up with him? No. <laughs> <laughs> a moment that becomes almost Greek within the context of Ronnie's later psychopathic reactions to Sammy's perceived infidelities and transgressions, a series of conflicts that make up the bulk of season 3. The relationship is textbook abusive, with physical violence on both ends, constant accusations and paranoia about infidelity, and regular verbal abuse. If this sounds not really entertaining and mostly unpleasant and concerning, your instincts are pretty much correct. There are multiple points whereby any moral standards the production crew should have intervened, but at every opportunity to do so, they simply flood the room with cameras and do their best to capture every angle of the domestic abuse as it happens. Supposedly, cast members at certain points in Season 3 pleaded with producers to do something about the imminently violent relationship. Season 3 is both the relationship's most explosive period and the show's peak in viewership, and is probably the proper pick for most definitive season of the show. Throughout the show, the other cast members pretty much do their best to steer clear of Sammy and Ronnie's relationship, and it's abundantly clear that none of them enjoy sharing the shore house with the imploding couple. Some of the conflict between Ronnie and Sammy in Season 3 seems to have stemmed from the fact that the cast was supposedly allowed to watch season 2 as it aired during filming, which would entail certain lies from that season being revealed. The point to be traced out of this is that the show's at its peak when it's exoticizing the terrible decisions and mental anguish of its cast. And I don't just mean peak viewership, though it's true that horrific conflict rakes in huge numbers for Jersey Shore. The show itself has the most to work with when what's happening on screen is viscerally unpleasant. It's well documented that people like watching really morbid stuff sometimes, and that same attraction to morbidity can be paralleled in the appeal of reality TV, but what I'd like to highlight here is that Jersey Shore manages to be at its most captive not just when what's happening on screen is deplorable and morbid, but when those same things are the unmistakable product of real humans making real decisions. There's some element that becomes that much more attractive when the people screaming at each other stutter sometimes, or say dumb stuff that doesn't make sense, or reconcile again and again, somehow unaware that they'll always end up in the same situation. The attractive disgust felt transforms from an emotion about events happening in a TV show to an emotion about people in general. Thousands of people find themselves in similarly awful positions to Ronnie and Sammy every day, and there are certain aspects of human behavior that makes such situations hard to avoid and hard to escape, aspects that can be found in nearly everyone. What Jersey Shore does so insidiously well is draw parallels to people writ large by failing to cut out the humanity of its cast. The situation's pathological lies, and Snooki's impulsive self-destruction, and Dina's constantly compounding loneliness all harbor notes of essential and specific human failure that even the most self-aware and successful people never find themselves completely rid of. Nearly everyone knows someone that makes mistakes in a similar vein, maybe even themselves, enough so that a show like Jersey Shore is capable 
capable of personal resonance, making it that much more entrancing. This is my explanation for why Jersey Shore becomes so genuinely uncomfortable to watch for anything more than short bursts. Not only are the on-screen events often unpleasant, but the more you watch, the easier it is to slip away into casual recognition of the little behaviors and qualities that lead to conflict and unhappiness among nearly everyone. This is an unintended side effect of production's desire to obtain the most filterless people conceivable. These internal mechanisms and missteps become that much more obvious, a perception that grows and becomes clearer the longer you watch for. But this is an illusion, at least in part. One of the seductive things about reality TV is how expertly it fakes feelings of intimacy. While a show like Jersey Shore certainly allows for deep glimpses into the everyday lives of its cast, it's still ultimately TV, and you can't really know the people shown in the way it feels like you do. Many modern YouTube channels engage in similar strategies to nurture a false sense of familiarity with the audience and thus retain them for longer periods. In actuality, one of the most cunning things about Jersey Shore may be that it's able to elicit such a perception of its cast when it may not even be totally accurate. Which isn't to say that any creation of this image is intentional. There's no doubt that the intended perception of the show is far from off-putting and pathetic, but rather that it's a side effect of the more conscious manipulations found in the post-production of reality TV. At least some amount of the recognizable unconscious behavior the cast engages in is created by how the footage itself is constructed and relayed to the audience, and unfortunately, what proportion that is can't be known. So if Jersey Shore is capable of creating these feelings, and not all of them are the product of the cast itself as it appears, then there's a deduction to be made. There has to be some attribute of Jersey Shore, as it's produced, that's capable of teasing out depthful emotional responses contrary to the traditional image of reality TV, but it comes about by a process that's akin to harvesting the despair of maladjusted people. As I've said thus far, the characters found in Jersey Shore are both real and not. They're chimeras of real actions and behaviors that are arranged in an unnatural way during post-production. One of the most obvious and effective ways editors create these characters is through the implementation of the on-the-fly interview. There's a lot of context to even seemingly basic social interactions. Previous experiences alter social dynamics between the participants, and certain unspoken thoughts never make their way to the surface. In traditional fiction, it suffices that the author has absolute control over the experiences and thoughts of each character, and by creating new events and displaying them to an audience, they create depth. Reality TV has a similar goal, but it has a much harder time getting there as a result of the fact that in reality TV, producers can't create new events. They have only what their cameras have. While watching all the hundreds of hours of raw footage collected may draw out the elements of each social interaction that producers want, the fact that these dynamics are interconnected, sometimes impossibly complex, and usually linked between hundreds of different experiences and situations over long periods, mean that there's often no obvious way for simple cutting to produce the understanding of each character and situation required for clear and easy viewing, hence the devious on-the-fly interview. Over the course of filming, producers periodically take each cast member into an isolated room and ask them a series of questions to be answered in the present tense. What were you thinking when X did Y? The result of these simple questions is a valuable tool in the quest to create reality TV. Each answer can be spliced into footage ad hoc to create what appears to viewers as an internal monologue for each character, in which they explain their thoughts in clear, relatable terms that reveal the context and motivation behind every action. The presence of the on-the-fly interview eliminates much of the complexity and ambiguity present in the raw footage, and allows for instant context to be injected whenever the show's construction demands it. The implementation of the on-the-fly interview is also the moment in which the cast member becomes a character rather than a human being. Cast members do not choose what questions are asked and which answers are included. That power belongs to the producers. They're the ones able to decide which thoughts of each cast member are emphasized and which are left on the cutting room floor, meaning they choose what was and was not important to each character. An event that may have barely registered for the cast member at the time can be put on a falsely level playing field with events that matter to them quite a lot. Events can concerning other characters that the interviewee barely paid attention to suddenly come across as important to them, suggesting a level of emotional involvement that didn't exist. Things done off the cuff, not thought through, or as a reflex can suddenly seem calculated and full of intent when in fact they were not, and all at the discretion of production. The on-the-fly interview is the central tool that allows the producers to create the characters of Jersey Shore. It gives them a heavy level of control over the experiences of the cast as perceived by the audience, and along with careful cutting, it constitutes the core of reality TV fakeness. The on-the-fly the fly interview also serves as an engine of exposition when necessary, allowing producers to pair footage of the cast preparing for an outing at the club or yet another prank with an unambiguous and immediate explanation of exactly what the cast is doing and why. It cuts out much of the legwork necessary to interpret social dynamics naturally by expressing them in plain language, and in doing so, it introduces authority to the version of events cut together by producers. This is what I mean when I say the characters of Jersey Shore are both real and fake. They're the TV equivalent of blackout poetry. Each piece contains an element of reality that even in its false construction can gleam through, but the product as a whole is so completely crafted as to be anything but real. 
They get five hundred. We give them five hundred dollars a week to spend on food. They make three hundred dollars a week scooping ice cream, and he's bitching about it like it's his own cash. Despite all the hoopla about how Jersey Shore was the monolith prophesizing the death of decent culture in the US, it's all but vanished from relevancy by now, save for the odd linguistic contribution. The revival series, Jersey Shore Family Vacation, receives a fraction of the original's viewership, and the show's cast has been relegated to the vast pool of ex-fascinating cultural freak shows, unearthed for the occasional scandal or where are they now article. Reality TV, though still existent, has been on the decline for years, barely holding its own on the already sinking ship of network television. The voyeuristic appeal of shows like Jersey Shore seems to have been just some of the first guttural sounds of the internet's parasocial nexus, and as a vehicle of morbid fascination it's been well outpaced. Even in the show's original run, by the fifth season most everyone had chilled out, and the explosive conflicts of the first four seasons had become a rarity rather than a constant. Subsisting on the despair of neurotic strangers was only going to last so long, since, like anyone else would, they eventually learned how to coexist. And though they didn't really seem to be enjoying it, they could at least bear the filming conditions long enough to snag a cool paycheck. If at any point in this video, for one reason or another, you decided it might be a good idea to watch this show, I'd like to firmly advise against doing that. If this video could be said to have a thesis, it's definitely not that Jersey Shore is a show you should watch, or something that's really demanding of your attention in any capacity. Reality TV is crafted to prey on our weakest instincts. Our interest in gossip, conflict, and self destruction can be really easy to snag in the right situation, but all the rhetorical tricks of TV production are insufficient unless the right combination of natural factors appears. Scouting and producing a whole show in the vague hope it might coalesce into something dramatic and attention-grabbing is a strategy that might work sometimes, but it creates, at its core, transient success. When Jersey Shore deflates in its later seasons, it's for this reason. Despite its amassed reputation as a soulless, lowbrow waste, I think there's more to get out of Jersey Shore than most TV dramas, so long as you remain conscious of the circumstances of its production. Watch the eyes, they tell more than you think.